And this, my friends, is how legally and ethically millionaires understand a tax code, grow their money, and not get whacked in taxes like everybody else. You don't do millionaire things once you become a millionaire. No, you do things before you become a millionaire, so therefore you build up to become a first generation cash flow millionaire. So in this video, I'll explain five ways millionaires build tax-free wealth using life insurance in this episode of the Seven Figure Squad happening in three, two, one. Let's go. Never short stopping, now I'm winning like I'm Jada. Steady through the rigor, getting, getting bigger. Just fighting in them trenches, now I'm making seven figures like. What's cracking, everybody? My name is smart guy, Matt Zapala here. Hailing to you from Dallas, Texas. And if you haven't done so already, please hit subscribe. Our goal is to get to 150,000 subs, so therefore we can award a church, charity, or nonprofit $5,000 to help them through whatever it is that they're looking to do. From this YouTube channel, we want to assist them to do that with $5,000 once we get to 150,000 subs. We're almost there, so please, if you haven't done so already, please click subscribe. All right, so let's talk about what millionaires do with their finances. And by the way, just wanted to give you a heads up. You don't have to be rich to get these things started. When I came out the Marine Corps, I started with as little as 50 bucks a month to start this wealth building process, this rhythm on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. You don't need to be rich to become a millionaire. Uh, listen, most millionaires are self-made. It's not like they inherited money. It's not that because somebody blessed them with a business. No, they were self-made, which means they built it from scratch. Yours truly in this video, I built my wealth from scratch. I took a $500 investment into business and years later, I created a $45 million company. Check out this video right here and how I made my money. And the industry that provides the common Joe access to what millionaires are able to create over generations is the life insurance industry. Let me explain. First way how millionaires build tax-free wealth is obviously through temporary needs. What am I talking about? Temporary needs. Income replacement. In other words, if you have a kid, if you have a wife, if you have a husband, you have a family, Lord forbid, uh, something happens to you, you have income to replace the money that you're bringing to that household for five years, for 10 years, for 20 years, using something as simple as a term insurance policy, which is the style of policy that a lot of people know a lot about because it's the cheapest to purchase, but the most biggest payoff sadly when that situation, if that situation was to arise. So if something were to happen to you, let's say you're paying 35 bucks a month or 50 bucks a month into a life insurance policy and it has a death benefit of $500,000. Well, something happens to you, at least for the next 10 years, using that math, in the next 10 years, your family can draw $50,000 a year for 10 years from that life insurance policy in case something were to happen to you. So if your children are, for example, five years old and three years old, so you have income to replace you for $50,000 a year for the next 10 years of which you would have made anyway had you been working. But sadly, if the Lord called you home sooner than later, you have money to replace you using an income replacement strategy. And that's what life insurance is used for. Another area that uh, life insurance is used for by millionaires is pay off debt. So for example, if you have a 15 year mortgage, a 30 year mortgage, a 20 year payment plan to pay off your student loans, usually the millionaires will create a life insurance policy to pay off that debt. So therefore, if something happens to you, the mortgage is paid off. The student loan debt is paid off. So therefore, if you had a co-signer like a parent or somebody else in your family, they're no longer saddled with that debt after you paid off. One of the worst things that can happen is if you co-sign with somebody on a piece of property, you co-sign with somebody on a car loan, you co-sign with somebody on student loan debt, if something were to happen to the other person, you, since you're the co-signer, you are still responsible for repayment of that debt. So it's sad to pass away too soon. It's sadder to pass away too soon and still leave somebody else with debt. That's why millionaires use life insurance to pay off that debt in case something were to happen to them sooner than later. Another way is for college or business. So therefore, if something again were to happen to you, a portion of the lump sum that is given to the beneficiary, they can use that money to go to college or take that same money to start a business. So therefore, you're still blessing that next generation or whomever that beneficiary is. And by the way, you can change that beneficiary as many times as you like based on uh, your relationship with your agent and a life insurance company. You can fill out that form dozens of times to restate who your beneficiary is, who's gonna get that money to get them to college, who's gonna get that money to get them to start their business, whomever that is. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. Many times people uh, purchase a house, but you can't get the keys to the house at the title company unless you show them proof of homeowner's insurance, right? Same thing too with the car. You might have the credit score, you might have the down payment, but you can't take ownership of that car unless you show them proof of car insurance, right? 
Same thing too with phone. How many times do you get upsold? Hey, you bought a new iPhone. For example, tomorrow, the shooting of this video, tomorrow is the new release of the iPhone 13. But you're probably gonna be asked, would you like Apple Pay? $9.99 a month, $14.99 a month. So therefore, if something happens to this phone, you can replace the screen, you can replace a phone, just by send it into Apple and they'll send you a brand new one. That's called insuring your uh, cell phone. Same thing with credit cards. Something they uh, ask you in the credit card, say, would you like to pay X amount of dollars in case you die, the debt of this credit card is paid off. So bottom line is those life insurance pays off the mortgage, pays directly off the car, it pays directly to the bank, right? The creditor that's giving you the money for that home, that car, for that cell phone, or in case, or in this case, unsecured credit cards. But what about you? Aren't you an asset? Aren't you the most important financial instrument to your household? So that's what millionaires realize, that without me, none of this, financially speaking, works. None of this goes forward. Matter of fact, if I don't insure me because I'm the biggest asset to my family, and if I'm the financial engine that makes this family get from one generation financially successful to the next generation, and something happens to me prematurely, then our generation is actually set back. So the question you want to ask yourself is, if I believe in the responsibility and the stewardship of who I am as a man, as a woman, as a family member, as somebody leading our family from one generation to the next, do you want your family to be blessed in the next generation to receive a financial inheritance from you? Or do you want them set back? By the way, I haven't even talked about funerals. This is probably one of the temporary needs to pay for funeral expenses. One of the greatest ways that divides siblings is at the funeral and they argue about who pays for mom or dad's funeral. One of the greatest ways, one of the most divisive situations in most people's lives. How do you protect that divisiveness? By purchasing a final expense life insurance policy, again, for temporary needs. Okay, second way that millionaires build tax-free wealth using life insurance is uh, you, they use life insurance for college planning. See folks, this is not your granddaddy's life insurance policy. And what am I talking about college planning? Why do you use life insurance for college planning? Right? And most people think, well, do you have to die first <laughs> in order for your beneficiary to use your life insurance policy? No. There's two styles of life insurance. One's temporary, which I just discovered here, which you, they usually use this style called term insurance. Ter temporary need, they use term insurance because it terminates at the end of the term. But the style of life insurance that uh, millionaires use for college planning is what they call permanent life, okay? Permanent life, and under permanent life, there's many different versions of permanent life, which is whole life, which is universal life, which is variable life, which is variable whole life, okay? Variable universal life, variable whole life, okay? And index universal life. These are different versions of the style of policy under the permanent category. And they use these versions for college planning. Why? Because according to the FAFSA form, the free application for federal student aid. Money is counted in two different categories. One is countable assets, and the other is non-countable assets. Let's take a look at this, what is countable and what's non-countable. Countable and reportable assets is cash in the bank, bank accounts, brokerage accounts, money market accounts, investments such as stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, et cetera, et cetera, precious metals, UGMAs, uniform gift to minors account, uniform uh, transfer to minors account, uh, college savings plans, uh, 529, Coverdale, education savings accounts, businesses that you might own, investment farms that you own, real estate transfer funds, emergency funds. These are what we call reportable and countable assets. And you must list on the FAFSA form, which helps that college determine what you are responsible for to help your child through college. And they call that the expected family contribution. Now, to lower the expected family contribution, a strategy that millionaires use, it's legal and ethical because they know the law is to reposition certain assets under non-countable or non-reportable assets. And they are this. Principal place of residence, family home, family farms, small businesses owned and controlled by the family, qualified retirement plans such as 401k, 403b, 457, et cetera, et cetera. Life insurance policies such as cash, value, and whole life. Personal possessions such as cars, boats, computer software, TV, equipment, and appliances. So you see, when it comes to making money, it's understanding what is out there and available for you, having access to advisors, having access to insurance agents that understand how life insurance plays a critical role in helping their students, their families, students get through college with the least amount of family contribution as possible, maximizing federal student aid, maximizing the college aid themselves through, through the actual uh, college uh, funds, 
scholarships and grants. And so therefore the family can still send their children successfully without that child being straddled in that much or at all student loan debt. Third one, millionaires use life insurance to accelerate the payoff of the house. No, they don't have to die to do this either, okay? They don't have to die to do this. So how many times have you seen somebody say, you know what, I got an extra $500 extra month and I'm just gonna go and send that additional payment to my mortgage company. So theoretically, I can accelerate the payment of my house because I'm knocking down the principal. And if I'm knocking down the principal, less interest is accumulating on what I owe to the bank. So therefore, I can effectively pay off my house sooner and faster. Let's take a look at this strategy. Most people, when they have a mortgage, it's got this kind of amortization of a, of a mortgage. In the beginning of a mortgage, okay, you pay the highest amount towards the interest towards the bank before you start cutting into principal. So in a normal payoff of a house, you're paying, 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 you're paying. And then you start knocking down some interest and knocking down some interest, you're cutting into the principal of the loan. And so therefore, eventually over time, over a 30 year period, you pay off the mortgage on a house, okay? That's traditionally what happens when people have a mortgage. Now, the strategy here is what millionaires use, instead of sending that additional $500 to the mortgage, because here's a problem. Let's say I send an additional $500 extra to the mortgage company. What we learned through the 08, 09 Great Recession is that equity inside one's property whether investment property or the personal residential property, equity inside the property is illiquid. So if you need $50,000 right now, boom, I need 50 grand, what are you gonna do? Sell your house today and get the $50,000? Refinance your house today and get the $50,000? No, it's illiquid, you can't get access to it. Unless of course you have a homemaker line of credit, and maybe sometimes people have these uh, credit cards that represent homemaker lines of credit, to so, okay, if I have an emergency, I can slide the credit card because that then would be a debt that I own on home equity line of credit. But what did we learn through these hurricanes? What did we learn through Hurricane Katrina? What did we learn through tragedies? When these banks realized that these natural disasters are on their way, guess what these banks do? They cut that line of credit. <laughs> so who's in control? Do you want to be in control? Do you want the bank to be in control? I think the answer is obvious. If you want to maintain control and liquidity of the equity that's inside your property, you must rethink who you send that additional payment to. So in this example, somebody's sending an additional $500 additional to their mortgage company, but redirecting that same money towards a properly structured life insurance policy, which is utilizing a whole life policy, universal life policy. I would not use a variable life strategy in this example. By the way, I'm not giving investment advice. Check this with your investment advisors. I'm not a securities license type person. I'm not a financial advisor to give you that type of advice, but I am a licensed insurance agent, however, but ask your investment advisor, ask your financial advisor why a variable life policy may not be the right style and version of life insurance to use for this strategy. Because what happens if the stock market crashes and that's your home equity? The stock market crashes and you got your money inside a variable life policy. Well, that sucks because not only are you losing money in your property, because potentially principal residence and home equities may potentially drop. And guess what else is dropping? The stock market. And guess what's attached to the stock market? Your variable life policy. So you get both going negative all at the same time. What's the benefit of a whole life policy? What's the benefit of a universal life policy? What's the benefit of an index universal life policy? Is the principal and previous year's interest credited to the policy is guaranteed, it's guaranteed. And so when you're looking at where to redirect potentially your $500 into a strategy, that worst case scenario, everything's crashing, this $500 and then is redirected into a properly structured Whole life policy, universal life policy, index of universal life policy. And by the way, all my life insurance bodies are in the industry are probably going to comment right down, right down in the comment section. But who is the best strategy? All good. Check with the insurance agent. And I'm sure they're going to walk you through multiple illustrations to find out what's best for you. Because not every policy is the same for everybody. So make sure you check with your life insurance agent that's properly trained in these strategies. Okay. Back to this scenario. The additional five hundred dollars now is instead of being put towards the mortgage of the property is now redirected into a properly structured life insurance policy. So instead of the $500 accumulating inside the equity of the property, it's now accumulating into the cash value of the policy, which is able to be credited interest as the years goes by. And as money grows, the time value of money kicks in. Money is not only credited to the policy, but credited into the policy and compounding into the policy. And so therefore the cash inside the life insurance policy can grow to a point where like for example, I'm just throwing out a number. Let's say in uh, the 20th year, the life insurance policy cash value is equivalent now to the mortgage of the house. And you got choices. So if I, if, if I have, a, say for example, if I have $200,000 mortgage balance 
and my cash value inside my policy grew to $20,000 of cash value, I could potentially withdraw this $20,000 and effectively pay off the mortgage of the house. What's the downside? The downside is now I lose liquidity in my $20,000. You can do it, now you can be mortgage, mortgage free, but you lose 200, liquidity over the $200,000. So there's other nuances with this strategy, but this is one strategy that millionaires will use to redirect money inside a life insurance policy, so therefore they stay liquid, they're in control of the equity inside the property, and it gives the opportunity for the equity that would otherwise be earning 0% interest inside the property of the home, to give a shot for that equity, this extra $500, to give it a certain interest potential rate of return inside a life insurance policy over the years, whereas before, this equity is not earning any rate of return. Next one, millionaires use life insurance to build wealth, in this case, tax-favored wealth, to supplement their 401k, uh, their TSP, their third savings plan, their 403b, you know, et cetera. Any qualified plan they use, once they fund that, they use additional funds to fund a tax favor retirement alternative using a permanent life insurance strategy. Again, using the different style of permanent life and using different versions such as whole life, universal life, and index universal life. To further illustrate what rich people do, then know things, let's reference this video I did a couple years ago, how millionaires use life insurance to build wealth, but how executives of major corporations, yes, they're contributing to a 401k, but where are they really putting a lion's share of their salary into? Let's take a look at this video. If you don't think that was, uh, that was smart, look at, look at how all these smart people uh, handle their finances. This is 3M. This is the executives of 3M. This is, what they this is how they compensate their executives. So we got here uh, 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 Michael, Joaquin, Julie, Ashish, Nicholas, Ayn, Ng, uh, Thulin, I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing it the wrong way, and Michael F. Roman. The, they, these are executives that are contributing 4,500 bucks to the 401k plan. You think to myself, wait a minute, you contribute 21, 22,000 dollars to a 401k plan. Why are you only putting 4,500 dollars to your 3M 401k plan? You know what I'm thinking? I, I think that's probably the match. I think they're just contributing to their 401k plan up to the match and they're redirecting their money to this other strategy called, hmm, it says VIP excess company contributions and hmm, executive life insurance. So they're stuffing a lot of money inside executive life insurance. So why are they putting $23,000 in an insurance policy? Why are they putting eleven, twelve thousand, eight thousand, fifteen thousand dollars $12,000, $8,000, $15,000 of money inside life insurance respectively? It's not to get this cheap temporary policy. This executive life insurance is, is going to grow value over a period of time of which you can access in a very tax advantage basis. Let's take a look, let's take a look at a proxy statement here of, uh, of GE. The proxy statement is here, uh, page, uh, was it 79 here? This is the top execs also of GE. They're putting money inside the retirement plan. They're putting collectively 9450 for each one of these executives into the retirement plan, right? But if you look to the left column, they're putting life insurance premiums of $172,000, $107,000, $62,000, $226,000, $227,000, $136,000 a year into their life insurance policies. See, there are so many things that they just don't teach you in school. And so a couple of things to add to that. There's three tax buckets. There's tax now, tax later, and tax advantage. Where would you rather be growing your money? Tax now, tax later, or tax advantage, which potentially could be the equivalent of tax-free question is yours, especially as you're starting to build wealth today. The second thing is, do you want to be locked into pre-59.5 withdrawal penalty? Of course, the, uh, the recent Tax Cut Jobs Act that Trump passed in 2017 said, because of COVID, because all these different things, because of uh, these emergency situations, lockdowns, you can take money out of your qualified plan without the pre-59.5 years old 10% withdrawal penalty. But what happens when that's over, when this, we're, we're blowing through this whole thing? Well, guess what you're gonna do? You run across a situation, you got no other money saved up. If all you have is a 401k plan, guess what you're gonna have to pay? If you withdraw it from your 401k plan, you don't loan it, if you withdraw it from your 401k plan, it's going to be whacked in income taxes. The second part is if you're under 59 and a half years old, when you do that, they're gonna add another 10% on top of that too as well. So you're gonna have two things you pay for, taxes and penalties. Do you want your money exposed to unnecessary taxation, penalties and or fees well, you can mitigate that and eliminate that right now by having a strategy to do so by avoiding this pre-59.5 withdrawal 
rule. Also, if you do keep your money inside 401k plans, you say you, you don't pay attention to this video, you don't create any stress throughout your lifetime, there's what they call a required minimum distribution. In other words, if you're 70 and a half years old, you have your money inside 401ks, IRAs, et cetera, et cetera, you must take money out of that account at 70 and a half years old. However, if you turn 70 and a half years old after uh, uh, December 31st, 2019, you have to do that at 72 years old, but they still force you to take money out of the retirement plan. There's a minimum amount that you must withdraw. Why? Because they let you grow this money throughout your entire lifetime. Now the tax man cometh. Now they want their income tax on the money that they allow to be deferred inside these accounts. Now they want their fair share of taxes. So for the rest of your life, you, my friends, watching this video, if you keep your money inside a 401k, 403b, TSP, et cetera, et cetera, what they call a qualified plan, forever in your pocket will be the hand of Uncle Sam. What a lot of millionaires then use is not IRS code 401 chapter K, which by the way, that's where 401 comes, 401k comes from. It comes from IRS code 401 chapter K. IRS code 403 chapter B, IRS code 457 deferred complex. That's where these retirement plans come from is IRS codes. But if you want to know what the millionaires use, it's internal revenue code 7702, which means that if a life insurance policy meets the definition of life insurance, money can grow inside these policies, income tax-free, accumulate and grow income tax-free, and down the road could be access to loans and withdrawals without paying a dime in tax. And this, my friends, is how legally and ethically millionaires understand the tax code, grow their money, and not get whacked in taxes like everybody else. Last but not least, the millionaires use money to build tax-free wealth using life insurance by using what they call a wealth creation or wealth transfer strategy. Okay, so in other words, this is money that people don't need to live on. Let's say grandma, grandpa says, you know what, I got $50,000 left in a CD, I don't need to use it, I got $50,000 in a an account I don't need anymore. I've got enough for my pension. I got enough for my social security. I got enough from a, you know, loving, uh, uh, caring family and friends. Uh, I'm, I live a simple life. They don't need this, but they would love to transfer this fifty thousand dollars to the grandkids, an effective way to pass it on from one generation to the other is to do a one-time lump sum deposit, assuming that they qualify for life insurance, into a life insurance strategy. A quick example. Let's say fifty thousand dollars. Okay, $50,000 inside a CD. If they deposit $50,000 into a life insurance policy, this life insurance policy could potentially be worth $100,000. So if something happens to grandma, something happens to grandpa, this $50,000 effective then turns into a $100,000 tax-free death benefit at their death, which means that whoever the beneficiary is gets to receive this $100,000 without paying a dime in tax. So the question, the reason why this is effective is because, number one, what will it take for grandma and grandpa to grow $50,000 to $100,000 without asking for additional risk? The second part is, what does grandma and grandpa have to do to grow $50,000 to grow above $100,000? Because now you gotta pay tax, right? You gotta pay tax at their, at their demise. $100,000 net after taxes, what type of interest rate does grandma and grandma have to earn to earn $100,000 after tax? That's why life insurance, because here's the thing, life insurance at $50,000 from day one, if grandma uh, uh, qualifies for the policy, and Lord forbid, the next day passes away, the policy then, if it's in force, then will immediately pay out $100,000 to the beneficiary. It's automatically paid to the beneficiary. Automatically done, assuming that grandma qualified for the policy and the policy was issued. An effective way to transfer wealth. Here's another area, quick case study here. One time we had a client that had lots of real estate, lots of real estate, and um, our guys were doing the math. He said, you know what, hey, um, Mr. Client, if something were to happen to you, do you realize that you have to sell off a good chunk of your real estate portfolio because your assets grew over the 30, 40 years that you've owned them, and you bought them for little, but now they're worth a lot. But sadly, based on current estate tax codes, you've got to liquidate literally half of those properties just to pay the estate tax. Estate, E-S-T-A-T, estate tax. Because right now, there's an $11.7 million exemption. So in other words, for example, sadly that day when you or your loved one passes away. You gotta fill out the last income tax form for that year in which they passed away. In addition to that, your estate also have to submit to the IRS what you own, okay? And they do the calculations of what you own and what is estate tax, not just income taxable, 
but what is estate taxable. And if you have less than 11 point, based on 2021, if you have less than $11.7 million of total estate, whatever you own, your cars, your jewelry, your business interests, your stocks, your mutual funds, if it's less than $11.7 million, well, guess what? You owe zero estate tax. Okay. However, if you own more than that, guess what now? Any amount above the 11.7, by the way, this changes year after year. If you own more than 11.7, let's say in this example, you have $12.7 million. Well, according to current estate tax laws, they charge you a base tax. In addition to that, a marginal tax rate on the amount above the estate tax credit exemption. So, if you have a million dollars above, the tax is $345,800, plus they charge you 40% of the amount above the exclusion, above the exemption amount. So if, if you add, that's 40% of a million dollars, it's $400,000. So if you add the base tax rate of 345 and the marginal rate of $400,000, if you have a million dollars above the $11.7 million exemption, your estate tax is $745,000. So your family is left with the rest above the $11.7 million exemption. By the way, check with your income tax advisor. I'm not giving you investment advice. You're just hearing this from a friend. With that being said, we had a case study where we had a client that had a $23 million estate tax problem. So our advisors are life insurance agents, was properly trained in all these aspects, comes up with a strategy using an eyelid, an irrevocable life insurance trust. Because dad had what they call dormant assets. It just had money just sitting aside. By the way, at this level, some of you guys are excited when you have money in your pocket, you find an extra 20 bucks. Whoa, where'd that 20 bucks go? Man, thank goodness I have 20 bucks. Well, listen, at this level, when you're making millions upon millions upon millions upon millions, you'll have a couple million dollars set aside in a brokerage account or a bank account you just simply forgot about. Nice problem to have, right? Listen, man, I want you to be tomorrow's old money. That's why I'm glad you're watching these videos. By the way, if you affirm that, put it in the comment section below. I am tomorrow's old money. <laughs> Which means you're tomorrow's, you're tomorrow's rich, okay? That's what that means. I am tomorrow's old money. If you affirm that, put it in the comments section below. So in his scenario, wealthy guy, he had $2 million sitting in a brokerage account, earning 1%, if he even at that. And then he said, I could easily tuck away into this policy $500,000 per year. Okay, with everything he's got going on, boom, obviously this guy's stacked, this guy's loaded. By the way, immigrant family, uh, 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 started with nothing. The typical uh, millionaire next door started with scratch, became a self-made millionaire and just started to understand the rules of the money game. He's, he's in his 70s now, okay? I could easily put a $500,000 easily into his life insurance strategy and here's why he would consider doing it. Because from day one, assuming he gets qualified for the policy, which he did, his family, his, not, not actually his family, the trust, the irrevocable life insurance trust that his family members have a trustee, he repositions the $2 million that was earning a dormant let's round up to 1% in a brokerage account, he repossesses this into the life insurance policy, of which the owner and the beneficiary is the irrevocable life insurance trust. So it's outside of his estate. So therefore, it's not included in the 11.7 estate tax um, uh, calculations. So he repositions $2 million into the strategy, into his life insurance policy, okay? And, uh, and from day one, if something were to happen to him, $23 million gets paid into this irrevocable life insurance trust. Now, his family members will file that final tax return. They will file out the estate tax forms and they're gonna find out based on calculations that he owes, his estate owes, uh, a mom passed, sadly mom uh, passed away too as well, that the family estate owes to the government $23 million. Well, guess what? He put $2 million inside the life insurance policy and sadly, day one, or within inside the first year, he passes away. So this $2 million just turned into $23 million income and estate tax-free. The way it's titled 
and who owns it and who the beneficiary is, that's what this $2 million just turned into, an effective way to not only transfer wealth, but address any estate income tax issues down the road. Now, if he doesn't pass away in year one, he puts $500,000 into this policy. Every year, sadly, until the day he dies, okay? He puts $500,000 into this policy every year until he would pass away. And at that point, he obviously no longer pays the $500,000. So, well, Matt, why would I want to do that? Well, th think about this. Do the math. Let's, let's say his life expectancy in his 70s right now. What's his life expectancy of a 70-year-old? Okay? Less than 20 years. Okay? Even at that. If, even if he lives 20 years. So, why would he do that? Because $500,000 a year times 20 years equals $10 million. So, in other words... He's put $10 million into a life insurance policy? Yes. In addition to the $2 million? Yes. That's a total of $12 million into the policy, correct? Yes. But then the Lord takes him home. He's in heaven now. They put in, in this example, this scenario, $10 million plus a $2 million, totaling $12 million. But the life insurance policy still paid out $23 million to the Irrevocable Life Insurance Trust. So the family is able to pay the income tax and get Uncle Sam out of the way and keep the real estate holdings that he built for the 40, 50 years of his life intact without having to rush to fire sell anything at a discount. Because when you rush to sell things, chances are you might sell things at a discount. No, they're able to keep things intact, keep the properties intact, get the Uncle Sam uh, hands out of their pockets, out of their hair, and they move on with the next generation all without paying a dime in estate tax using the effective use of life insurance. So bottom line, this and many other strategies because there's just five of them, there's plenty more. But this is the way millionaires use to build wealth income tax-free using life insurance. Before I let you go, please check out these two videos here. Boom, how millionaires use life insurance to build wealth. So check out that video too as well. I shared a little bit of it in this video. And this video here is how life insurance not only pays you a death, but has living benefits in case you were to survive a heart attack, stroke, cancer, et cetera, et cetera. This video here is by website designer who purchased a policy from our firm. He was designing our website, but he also purchased a life insurance policy from us. And at 38 years old, he suffered a stroke. You check out his story, what happened Check out this video right here. With that being said, everybody, I'd love to know your thoughts, your comments, your feedback. You agree with some of these things I said. You don't agree with some of these things I said. Please put it in the comment section below. I'm glad we're all learning here. And if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like and follow our business page, Money Smart Guy. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe and hit notifications. Be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. With that being said, guys, from Dallas, Texas, I'm your Money Smart Guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to live smart, and be money smart today. Thank <laughs> you.